Well, last Sunday we talked a lot about good intentions. Good intentions are good, but they can go afoul. As we saw, this is what happened to Moses. So we're going to start off by taking a look at Moses and what, <coughs> excuse me, where he is so far. What's going on with Moses? And so I start out with a quote from Philip Reichen and Kent Hughes in Exodus, Save for God's Glory. It starts out by saying this. One old commentator eloquently described the choice that Moses made. Read in a palace, he exposed, excuse me, he espoused the cause of the people. Nurtured in the lap of luxury, he embraced adversity. Reared in the school of despots, he became the champion of liberty. Long associated with oppressors, he took the side of the oppressed. Ed educated as her son, he forfeited the favor of a princess to maintain the rights of the poor. With a crown in prospect, he had the magnanimity to choose a cross, and for the sake of his God in Israel, he abandoned ease, refinement, luxuries, and the highest earthly honors to be a houseless wanderer. Now we would all say that is wonderful. And how many of us, of us would make that same decision in his place. He is to be lauded. However, he had made tremendous sacrifices and, <clears throat> excuse me, and he had volunteered to go under the most trying suffering that no matter how good his intentions were, no matter how noble were his motives, when Moses decided to take matters into his own hand, he was outside the will of God. And that's no small thing. How many people today are like Moses? They are doing the best they can. I'm, I'm, I'm lim limiting this, of course, just to believers. And they do suffer for the decisions they make. And they have good intentions. But there's one, one thing missing. And that's their trust in God. You see, when Moses did all this without praying to God, without consulting God, he put himself in charge over his life rather than submitting to God's authority over him. He was making the decisions and the, sh and the shots. It was God who was left out. Now, everybody who would see what what uh, <laughs> Moses was doing would declare what a wonderful believer this person is. We can't see on the inside who they are who, who they are really trusting. So, did that mean that God was finished with him because he had erred in a very serious manner? A lot of his problem was timing. Because he didn't wait for God to determine the time and the place and the way that he was going to use Moses in order to take his people out of bondage. So, it doesn't mean that God was finished with Moses. You all know that. But, Moses still the man that God chose to free his people from bondage. God doesn't choose the elites of the world, nor the best educated, nor the most intelligent, nor the most accomplished, 
nor the wealthy are famous. That's not God's way. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 25, you might turn to that. This is an interesting couple of verses here. It is going to underscore what I'm talking about here. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 25. So I want you to remember that Moses was, was making the decision and calling the shots. Independent from God. First Corinthians chapter 1 verse 25. starting with the foolishness of God is wiser than men. Now, this is not in any way to say that anything about God is foolish. This is just a uh, used in a way to show that if God was foolish, his foolishness would be wiser than men. And the weakness of God is stronger than men. Same thing there. For consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not, not many mighty, not many noble, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame things which are strong. And the base things of the world and the despise God has chosen. The things that are not, that he might nullify the things that are. And here's the reason for all of this, that no man should boast before God. This is God's way. Now, if man was doing this, he would choose these people who are not famous, not exceedingly smart. So if, that, if you think that you're not special, that you're just an average person who makes mistakes, but you're doing the best you can, if that's who you are, then you are the type of person that God uses. You can get that from what we just read. Sometimes we give more honor and uh, more thought to people who are famous, who have a lot of authority, those type of things. That doesn't really say all that much about people. If we ever could realize that, it is now. Isn't that so? Because the real colors of people who are in high places, famous people, people who are uh, equipped with all these blessings, and yet they're like Moses in the sense that they're living their lives apart from God. So God chooses those who are humble. How many people that you see and you hear, uh, hear about on the news are humble. Now, there are some, and they really stand out, do they not? I love to hear these people that get on there, and they just talk to you. They're not trying to make a big impression. And many times, they're well-versed. The, they know things about current circumstances in our country, around the world. They're easy to listen to. But then, the problem is, there are people who are living independent from God, independent from the Constitution, independent from the things that are right. They're promoting themselves. That's one of the hardest things for people who are in government or in a business, whatever it is. Their goal is to get to the top and stay there. And rather than recognizing they are servants of the people, uh, they become self-serving in what they do and what they say. 
So God chooses us to demonstrate his grace, his power, his love, and his glory. Y'all know what Jesus Christ's occupation was? The carpenter. Now, if man was in charge of that, that wouldn't be so. And where was he born? In Bethlehem, a very small town, a very small place. Throughout all the things that are that you look at with regards to how God operates, we find that he takes the things that are not to silence the things that are. That's what it means. So, I think I have a PowerPoint on this. Let's see if we're going to be able to do this. There it is. Now, let's see if I can bring it up. Okay. If this button works, it's going to be the first time. Right, there it is. Okay. Talking about God here, he takes sinners, losers, and failures who are hot to fulfill his plan and reveal his glory. Now, I'm not talking about hot temperature-wise or a hot like they're on their game. In fact, I'm going to show you here what hot means. It's an acrostic. The H stands for humble. Humble is a submissive attitude that excludes arrogance. It is a willingness to listen and learn from someone else. Wow, is that a big one there? A lot of people who are intelligent and well-versed have nearly a built-in problem because they think they know more than everybody else. And any time you try to tell them something, you'll hear, yeah, but, and then they're going to try to outdo you. They don't listen, and they're unteachable. So, again, God takes sinners, losers, and failures. Who is he talking about? Us, right? But they have to be hot. And then he will fulfill his plan and reveal his glory through them. The next one is the O. This has to do with objectivity. Objectivity means to make decisions based on principles and facts rather than emotions. And that can be hard to do. Situations can get to a boiling point, but God is looking for objectivity. One way you can tell if you're objective or not is when someone is giving you criticism. Hopefully it's constructive criticism. But there are uh, there are people like myself who are not very fond of any kind of criticism. And so we have to remember that we have to focus on facts and principles rather than emotion. Just think about yourself. When was the last time somebody criticized you? Now, unfortunately, a lot of times the criticism can be just un, unneeded, I guess you could say. A lot of people will criticize. In fact, if you're going to criticize something or someone, who should it be? Huh? Let's hear it. Yourself. That didn't happen all that often, does it? I mean, the last thing we want to do is criticize ourselves. And if there's some kind of uh, conflict and we start thinking about it, I submit to you, the first person that we think about criticizing is not ourselves. It's the other guy. Look what he did. And so, when God straightens us out, for parents, when they straighten out their children, the parents aren't doing that because they don't like the children, and hopefully they're not showing their anger to their children. They're showing their love to their children. And that's what people who love you will tell you the truth when everybody else is saying, oh yeah, this is fine, this is fine and dandy. Those who love you will say, no, this is not a good thing. And they will tell you 
because they love you because you need to address. So objectivity is very important, and that's what God is looking for as well. Because some people say, okay, I went to church, I got saved, and now I'm ready to uh, go to the top of the mountain, and I'll be there in a week. That's their mentality. And they start finding out that it's hard. They're not only battling against all the things that are out there in the world, but they have their old sin nature to deal with as well. And they get emotional. Emotions are the enemy to objectivity. And we have to fight that all the time. Well, by the way, where do these emotions come in? There's sometimes there's something that can happen or something that is said that triggers our hot button. And we didn't ask for it, but all of a sudden, our eyes are red, steam's coming out of our ears, and we're gnashing our teeth. I mean, it can happen that way. So we have to be on guard with that. Now, here's the last one is teachability. Teachability means you are willing to listen learn, and change. I would also submit to you, all three of those are not easy for us to do, are they? First of all, to listen. Now, I'm talking to just the husbands for right now. I happen to be one. And has your wife ever told you you just don't listen? I don't want to know that. I already know that. And sometimes they might say, they, 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 they just said something to you. And they say, what did I just say? <laughs> uh, how do you get out of that? Let me know. <laughs> I need a good excuse. Anyway, listening is not easy. Talking, oh, we can do that. We can rattle on. But I'm talking about listening. Today, conversation is nearly a thing in the past, especially with young people. It was, a, I guess, four or five years ago, I went to a movie. I'll never forget this. There were six teenagers about one row down from us. And I keep seeing this light. What is that light? Everyone had their phone. You know, this little light. And I was enjoying the movie, and they were texting each other. They weren't even looking at the screen. I don't know how much they paid to get in there. But they could have saved money, just get out there and sit on the bench and just do their little thumb deal. So, listening is very important. And then learning. You have to be objective to learn, don't you? There are people who have come into this church, there are people who have gone to every church, and they come in, it's the first time, and the pastor says something that they don't like or they, they don't agree with. And that's it. We're gone. Go out the door. Now, that might be a minuscule little bitty thing. And about 95% of the time, they've got it wrong anyway, but they're not open to listen. So learning is important too. And I guess the last one is the hardest. Change. People will go and stay in uh, hog parlor. By the way, most of you, I don't know, we have a lot of country folks in here. And most of you know what a hog water is. I know Dale does because we had one right here. Dale was my neighbor. He doesn't live there anymore. But, and, and right between him and I, there was a what? Hog parlor. That's what they call it. It's just a place where the, the swine and the pigs and hogs and all get water in the, in the mud. So some people will rather stay in that hog pile, that hog waller, that, uh, rather than changing and have something much better. Why is that? Is it stubbornness or is it fear? Is it fear that if you... At least you know what you have now, even if it's not good. But if you have to change, I think we're afraid we might not like it, so let's just stay here in Hogwarts. Change is very difficult. So, all of that was for the 
purpose of des describing what hot is. In Exodus chapter 2, verse 15, says, But Moses, that's what, by the way, this is, all this is, had to do with looking where Moses was at the particular time that we're studying in the Bible. Now we're going to Exodus chapter 2, verse 15, B, the last phrase, But Moses fled from the presence of Pharaoh and settled in the land of Midian, and he sat down by a well. So, the last uh, last Sunday I said, why did they throw in there that he sat down by a well? That's, that's, that doesn't seem all that important. Well, uh, the Midianites were descendants of Abraham through his wife Keturah. Keturah is spelled capital K-E-T-U-R-A-H. One of Abraham's several wives and you find that in Genesis chapter 25, verse 1 through 2. Those who, those were the Midianites. And they lived in a, in Midian. I don't know if this is going to work. Let's see. <clears throat> I'm sorry that's not big, but uh, Brett was showing me how to operate this and it just went blank on me, so I can use it anyhow. Y'all can see that, can't you? Okay. Um, <clears throat> here's Egypt over here. And this is Goshen. That's where all the Hebrews, the Israelites, were there. And so when Moses had to flee from the Pharaoh, he went from here all the way over to here. See, this says Midian right here. And so you have a long distance that he had to go to go from here to uh, go for the next phase that God was going to deal with him. One reason he had to get this far away was because Egypt had mining uh, mining places in here, and the median, excuse me, the Egyptian army had they had uh, this whole area. They would uh, have people, uh, the soldiers, would go and take care of this this uh, anything that happened in here. So he had to go all the way over here to get out of the clutches of Pharaoh. So I just wanted to show you how far that was. Well, let's see what I can do. All that just to show you that. I hope you enjoyed it. Okay. Uh, now, think about the culture shock that... Uh, Moses had. Uh, he lived in the lap of luxury. He ate the best food, wore the best clothes, had the best education, had numerous servants, and tremendous power, which he left in order to become a sheep herder among the nomadic desert <coughs> dwellers. Think about that. Who would do that? And the thing that I want you to keep in mind is all of this, that decision is to be lauded. It is to be seen as something that very few people will do. It, and it, it deserves applause. However, we keep have to going back to the point that he did it his own way. God was not a part of it. So Moses would toil as a sheep herder for 40 years and probably thought that he would never see Egypt again. Wouldn't that be plausible? He might have thought that 
God was through with him. He'd never see Egypt again, and God forgot about him. Did you hear how long he was there? Forty years. He was 40 years old when he left Egypt. Now he spends 40 years there. But of course, God was still going to use Moses in a big way. Now, we need to always remember that God is working in the background continually in order for us to be able to fulfill our mission on earth. You have a mission. God has a plan for you. He has a plan for me. And it doesn't matter how bad we have sinned, how bad a mess we've made for ourselves. God doesn't say, okay, I'm done with him. I'll go get somebody better. Well, there's nobody better. We're all sinners. We're all failures. And we need to remember that God never forsakes us. He never will leave us, and he will never forget us. Now, there are people, there's probably someone, or maybe, maybe more than one person here, that has been suffering for a long time. And they think, well, I'm just an average person. God really isn't all that interested in me. They even get to the point to where they think he forgot about me. A lot of times this will be because of an illness or because of a lack of health. And, and they think, well, uh, you know, God could heal me if he wanted to, and yet they just continue to think that God has left them. And this is what I'm telling you. It doesn't matter how long you are in a particular routine of what's going on, and you think, well, I'm not famous. I'm not, no, nobody cares about what I say. Why would God care about me? And that is, how would I say this? God cares about you more than you could ever think in a thousand years. If there was no one else on the planet but you, he would still treat you in the same way that he would treat everyone else in the sense of he loves you in a love that you can't believe. So we don't we don't see we don't seem and it may seem that he's forgot about us. Because time for us, look, I just said forty years. He leaves Egypt, he goes to Midian, and it's 40 years before God is going to talk to him through the burning book. And we're right close to that. What happened during those 40 years? Well, for one thing, God was training Moses to do the job that he called him to do. Now, he already messed it up big time by leaving God out of it and doing it himself. But now... He's, it takes 40 years. Listen, 40 years is a long time, isn't it? And yet, God is faithful. He'll never forsake us. He'll never forget about us. So, that was Exodus chapter 2, verse 15b. And, and we're not quite done with it because it says, and he sat down by a well. Why would... God the Holy Spirit inspired Moses to write down, he sat down by a well. well. What difference does it make where he sat down on a well or sat down on a boat in the sea or whatever it was? Here's the reason. The well was a place of conversation. It was a place to meet people. Everybody had to have water. And so everybody would go to the well. And if you wanted to meet somebody, that would, of course, be the place you want to go because you're going to meet people. And you're going to find out uh, the lay of the land. You might be able to get directions there. And so he was smart going there. That was a place where he knew that he was going to meet someone anyway. Now, he's not the only one that went to a well and... God used that place for the next step in his, in his uh, chapter of, of his life. Abraham had a servant, and he sent him to a city called Nahar, and he was going to find a wife for Isaac. And he found Rebecca. In fact, that, that was his future wife. Where did he find her? At a well. 
That's in Genesis chapter 24, verse 16. Jacob also found his future wife, which was Rachel, at a well. And that is in Genesis chapter 29, verse 9. So, if you want to meet someone, if you in the olden times, in ancient times, you would go to the well. That's where it was happening. That's where all the chit-chat took place. And you're going to find someone there because people need to have water. So that's why it says that. Now, let's read in our Bibles. Get your Bible ready to read through that. We just finished 15. Now we'll pick up 16. Now the priests of Midian had seven daughters and they came to draw water and fill their troughs to, troughs to water their father's flock. Then the shepherds came and drove them away, but Moses stood up and helped them and watered their flock. When they came to Ruel, also known as Jethro, their father, he said, why have you come back so soon today? And they said, an Egyptian delivered us from the hand of the shepherds. And what is more, he even drew the water for us and watered the flock. And he said to his daughters, where, where is he then? Of course. Why is it that you have left him, left the man behind? Invite him to have some, something to eat with us. Now, let's start with verse 17. Put a little meat on the bones here. And I want you to underline the word stood up. Stood up can mean several things. It can mean just Standing up, you're sitting down, you stand up. It can mean being jilted on a date. They stood her up or stood him up. But here, the Hebrew word is kum, K-U-M, and it has about nine different definitions. But Definition number five is the one that is appropriate for what is what it means here in verse 17. It means to be in opposition to a foe or opponent. To be in opposition to a foe or opponent. So when he stood up, it means he was in opposition to these shepherds, these bullies who were terrifying the daughters of Jethro. And so that would suggest that when he said he stood up, he just didn't st stand up and say, y'all ought not do that. No, it means he ran them all. He stood up and opposed them. And I also want you to note that they were shepherds, not one, at least two. There might have been a dozen there. It depends on how many sheep they have. And he was able to rout them because he was trained uh, by the best in Egypt in military tactics. So that's important to note that. Furthermore, there's another definition of this kum that means to stand up. And definition number three is to confirm something as valid and in force. To stand up means to confirm something as valid as and in force. I'll give you an example. You've heard me say this a thousand times. Something like it, anyway. We all should stand or stand up for righteousness. And that is confirming something that is valid and in force. And in this case, in this example, it is righteousness that is valid and in force. And there's a lot of people in our country today that need to hear that, need to see it acted out by believers. Also, this was the second time that Moses came to the aid of someone who was experiencing injust, uh, in, injustice. 
In fact, they were abusing. Remember, the first one was the uh, Hebrew back in Egypt that the uh, slave driver was beating, and he came in and helped. And this time he's doing it again. And this, of course, this was the men taking care of the women. I mean, excuse me, abusing the women. So Moses was learning from his experience back in Egypt. He evidently ran the bullies off rather than killing them. So he's doing better. He also drew water from the well to water the daughter's sheep. And this was unheard of. Why? Because in that time, that was a woman's job. And here you have this prior heir to the throne of Egypt, not only saving them and running off the bullies, but filling the trough and uh, watering their sheep. Now, there's something that's, again, I guess the guys are going to think I'm picking on this morning. But, if you are married and you think, well, there's women work and there's men work. Man work. The women need to stay in the kitchen. The men need to stay outside. The wife takes care of the inside. I take care of the outside. That is a horse's ass. Unable to love. Unable to be thoughtful. What if your wife is sick and Doing the dishes is women work. What are you going to do? Just use them up until you got to go buy some paper plates? Uh, I mean, and uh, this, this is something that men, and this is no small thing. A man that helps his wife when he doesn't have to, even if it's women's work, keeping the house, vacuuming, whatever it is, is a man that is confident in his masculinity and he has the capacity to love someone to do whatever is needed no matter what it is. That's why I call that person a man. I won't say it again, but you heard it the first time. I just thought I would throw that in because it's a credit to Moses. What a great thing he did there. I would love to be a fly on the wall and see what happened. How many of you saw uh, the movie Exodus with Charleston Heston? Don't remember that? I think they did a great job of uh, trying to project what this scene must have looked like. He had a rod in his hand and ran them off. And so you would think that out of seven daughters, seven women, one of them would say, well, why don't you come home and have supper with us? And they didn't do that. They were probably just awestruck and still can't believe what happened. And so they go back to their dad, uh, got home, and said, why are you here so early? And they told him, well, um, this Egyptian, how did they know he was Egyptian? By how he's dressed. This Egyptian came in and uh, took the bullies and ran them off. Now this was something that was ongoing because they said the shepherds had, I don't remember exactly how, word, how did let's see how did they word that. Um, he says, "Why are you back so early today?" So they said, "An Egyptian delivered us from the hand of the shepherds, and what is more, he drew water for us and watered the flock." When they say even even more, they were shocked that any man would do this, much less a person, uh, a man that just drew, drew drove away the bullies and so forth. He said to his daughters, where is he then? He expected, well, if they did, he did this great feat, why didn't you bring him to supper? They were probably afraid they needed to ask dad first. Why is it that you have left the man behind? Invite, invite him uh, to have something to eat. So, Moses made himself a servant Servant to the daughters. He demonstrated good leadership, for God expects his leaders to be servants. In fact, all good leaders are servants. That's what you are if you are a leader. 
A lot of people say, oh, I wish I had authority. I wish I had more responsibility and everything. Well, you, you spell authority and leadership with S-E-R-V-I-C-E, service, or servant. You're a servant to the people. Service is always one of the first topics of that God covers in his leadership training course. Now, that's not something you apply to. It just happens in life. Anyone who aspires to become a spiritual leader should begin by finding a place of humble service. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 20 and verse 25. I'll give you a little background before we get to start with verse 25. The mother of the sons of Zebedee came to Christ and said, I have a request. Will you take my two sons and uh, put them on your right hand and left hand of your throne uh, when, when you are at the right time. Now, that takes what I would say, what we used to call gall. I mean, to go up to Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the God-man, the one who created the heavens and the earth. And so when he's going to sit on his throne, she wants to know, uh, will you let my two sons be on each side? And... He, she, she, of course, she says, that's not mine to give. And then we get down. That, that sets the, the tenor for what's happening in verse 25. Then in verse 25, but Jesus called them to himself, his disciples, and he said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them and their great men exercise authority over them. There's no, there's no service there. It's all nothing but force. By the way, that's how we're operating in our country today. It's not anything other than that the, the people have any say in it. What what matters is do it or you'll go to prison. Do it or we're gonna we're gonna make it hard on you. That's the way it had always been. Is that what is the way it was then? In verse twenty six it, say, it says, "It is not so among you, but whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant." Underline that. Again, husbands, you are the authority in your household. And if you're going to be a good husband, you have to be a good what? Servant. And you volunteer to take out the trash. You volunteer to do all the dirty works. All these things. Yeah, but you're the boss. Well, the boss's job is to serve. Verse 27. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So I was just backing up what I've been telling you about leadership and is really all about service. And it's also about responsibility. I could also say, that the real meaning of authority and leadership is responsibility and service. You're responsible to serve those that you have authority. Now here's a great poem for those who have a grandiose a grandiose uh, goal to become well-known and of be a famous leader in your own, in your possession, in, in your profession. And I'm going to go back to the, we've got this on PowerPoint. Let's see if I can get it here. Uh, 
Now, let me give you a little background of this before I get to it. When I started this church, I guess that's 31 years ago, we only had just this part right here, and where all those people are sitting in the back, we had a junior class, a nursery, and two restrooms in that space. But in any case, just the chairs you see here exist. And so I thought that, okay, when a pastor starts a church and he's teaching, and over a period of time, it grows and the numbers get bigger. Well, that wasn't happening. We had about 15 people, maybe 20, and it was that way for a long time. And I thought to myself, I must be doing something wrong. Because, I mean, I'm, I'm teaching, and I know I'm teaching accurately, and yet it's not growing. Well, at that time, I was in the same place Moses was when God put him in Midian. He was preparing him. He was preparing me to be able to handle more people. And I thought, you know, it took me a, a while to come to that conclusion. What I needed to know is that it doesn't matter how big a congregation you have. The main thing is whether it's a congregation or whatever it is in your life that you think should be expanded or bigger or whatever. God is looking at the part of faithfulness. And this part that I'm about to show you, at that time when I needed it the most, I don't remember where I found it, but God gave it to me and it changed everything. And to this very day, it's still a help to me to be help to anyone. So let's see if it's going to come up here. There it is. Okay. The title of this poem is Do the Best You Can Where You Are With What You Have. Do the best you can where you are with what you have. And here's how it goes. Father, where shall I work today? And my love flowed warm and free. Then he pointed out a humble spot and said, Tend that for me. I answered quickly, Oh no, not that. Why no one would ever see, no matter how well my work was done. Not that little place for me. The word he spoke, it was not stern. He answered me tenderly. Ah, little one, search thine heart. Are you working for them or me? Nazareth was a little place, and so was Galilee. And that was the medicine I needed. We are to grow wherever we're planting. And if you seek adoration, and you seek fame, attention, none of that has any place in God's so you might find yourself right now in a place where you think you're stagnant. Nothing's happening. I, I'm, I'm just a nobody, and you just think that it's all for naught. He's preparing you for what's next. And if you're hot, humble, objective, and teachable, at his time, he's going to promote you, and when he promotes you, it won't be promoting you over a, over a place that you can't handle. When he promotes you, he promotes you to the right place at the right time with the right job. The clock has already shows me that we've been here an hour. But I'm glad I ended with that. In fact, uh, Mary, I'm going to take this poem and send it to you so you can send it out to everybody on our uh, email list. Because if that poem can do for you what it did to me and continues to do to me, it's all about humble. And it's whoever, I don't even know who wrote it. 
whoever did certainly had touched a lot of people. The last portion of our service is for those who are either online or who are here, and they have an ongoing issue with fear. Because we all know that we're temporal. We're all going to die. Unless Jesus Christ comes, then we'll be instantly changed into a, a resurrection body. But we have nothing to fear. I know this congregation. I pray individually for everyone in this congregation. And I know you. And you're not afraid because you depend on the promise of God. It doesn't have anything to do with how great you are. It has everything to do with Jesus Christ who went to the cross and paid for your sin. That debt is paid. He said it's finished on the cross. Now we know that we have eternal life. And we got it as a gift. It's the only way God gives eternal life is as a gift. It's worked for. We also have his own righteousness. And so you can improve on that. These are things that are irrevocable. And they're done. They're permanent. So now it's all about us living a life through the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, the Holy Spirit living through us. And so we don't have to fear the future when we die. Because we have a personal sense of eternal destiny. We're looking into the future right now as to what we might be, where, we, where we're going to be. We're not in heaven, but so many rewards and decorations and privileges are a great motivating force for us to keep on keeping on. So what I'm telling you is, if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross, then in that moment, you're born again. You become a member of God's phenomenal family. Your ticket to heaven is guaranteed. Now, God can use you to fulfill the mission that he has for you. That's fine. Heavenly Father, your, your word is so rich. And it goes places where nothing else can go, deep into our soul. We pray that you will help us to have ears to hear, eyes to see, so that we can be good and faithful servants. If we, if we think we're stuck in a rut, because it seems like nothing's happening and you're not near, you don't care, maybe you forgot about us, that's all rubbish. You are preparing us for the next promotion. Help us to think in those terms and give glory to God and for His grace and the fact that He cares for us and will never leave us or forsake us. Help us to meditate on things above and not on things of the earth. And we pray this in Jesus' most high and holy name.